Um, I think what's really intriguing about combi systems is the potential for a system to be put in that addresses, as Gary said, the uh, problem of backdrafting and spillage, the potential problem of, uh, of uh, deterioration of a chimney because the chimney is oversized when you move to uh, typically a, uh, a condensing furnace and then you have an orphan water heater. So the fact that this system could be the first stage of a, of a renovation where you basically are investing in making sure that you've got efficiency of heating, of space heating, and water heating. You're taking care of your combustion safety, but you also have a system which, if it performs as, in, as it's intended to, will perform very well at, at the home's current capacity, but also allow you to continue as, as, a, as funding's available, as resources are available, as our knowledge develops, to bring that house way, way, way further down in terms of making it much, much thermally efficient. So I think in theory, it's a very, very good transitional technology that basically allows us to stage, allows us to install it now and then just keep on going. But I think the biggest challenge is we've, we have not seen the performance that we would have expected to see. I, I think it's, um, it's very easy to assume that because it makes sense in principle that, that it should work in the field and yet there are a huge number of barriers. So the thing I'm really interested in is looking at how we could stimulate a fairly massive um, effort to work with manufacturers, work with the utilities, work with trades, work with uh, energy efficiency programs and initiatives, work with consumers to um, test the, the products that are emerging on the market, test different systems, uh, help to overcome a lot of the technical challenges of just, uh, you know, what, what is the correct way to install this, what's the decision tree regarding what kind of houses it will go best in, come up with a, a monitoring protocol so we could get fairly high quality data over a large number of houses and, um, and really move this technology further along because as it is, it's, it's the, the benefits are fragmented and we don't have any single, uh, what would it be, constituency that basically has it in their interest to just carry this one forward. So it's only, I think, through a collaborative effort where we have a number of uh, organizations that see the benefit coming together and getting behind it that could really move this from what's pretty much considered um, not particularly relevant. I tried to find somebody who was interested and had some experience installing these kinds of systems, talked to some HVAC contractors, and they've, they've been burnt, or they knew of people that were burnt from the Integra, the Apollo system from, you know, what, 15 years ago. So the problem is the earlier systems had some fairly major problems with controls, problems with performance and failure. So the HVAC industries, I think, has got a lot of respect for what can go wrong and how not to be uh, basically on the cutting edge, because that can be on the bleeding edge. So we really need to, I think, figure out a, uh, a strategic effort, and that's part of what in the session on Thursday, I'd like to sort of brainstorm how we could specifically move this forward. And, uh, but I'm really interested in finding out any of you that are also uh, share the same sort of intrigue and passion for this as a very uh, specific solution that solves a lot of problems by design. Um, so. so questions, folks? Lots of hands. Keep them up because the guy can't see you well. I see one here. I see one here in the front. Any over on this side? Nobody. Okay. Good job, Gary and Linda. Uh, just a couple of notes. One of You're them. You're supposed is to stand up and say your name, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Harvey Sachs from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. I wanted to get here early to meet you guys. Uh, good job. Just a couple of comments. These systems in my experience, can certainly be hot water priority. The controls become very simp simple. If you turn off the heating function in the kinds of houses you're dealing with, even in Saskatchewan, the rate at which temperature drops in the house, even on a cold night, is very, very slow relative to the length of a teenage shower. So that you can <laughs> let this thing drift slowly, slowly cooler without worrying about the water heating. There doesn't need to, uh, without worrying about the space heating, there doesn't need to be competition. Mm -hmm. And one other comment would be that electronics is coming to plumbing too. It's here. And you just look around the re room and read the magazines, and plumbers are smart folks and getting smarter. 
Harvey is absolutely correct. Electronics has arrived whether we like it or not. Um, and priority switches make an awful lot of sense. It means that's why we've been able to make this work for even with 40,000 BTU per hour water heaters. Um, it's not been a problem. You just tell the fan not to come on if you're, or the pump not to come on if you're trying to take a shower. Priority switches make a lot of sense. Up front here. Hello. Um, my name is Tony Amable. I'm a plumbing mechanical inspector from city and county of San Francisco. And we have seen a number of these uh, systems installed. From an inspector's point of view, there were some issues related to code, the, the issues about uh, open loops versus closed loops, boilers or water heaters. And now we have a lead-free <laughs> assembly bill in California, and I don't think anybody makes a certified lead-free fan coil unit that we know of. Uh, could you address any of these code uh, issues? Have you, have you seen a lead-free no. thing? So I, it wouldn't surprise me if those haven't been certified yet, so I would assume that they'd have to be in a closed loop, which would make sense to me. Um, I realize that added some cost to my system. On the other hand, it means I can go ahead and do it now. Um, exchange. That's right. And so there, there's clearly system costs that we have to work through. Um, open loop systems have their own sets of issues. Whether Forget the lead question for the moment, but there's all sorts of other questions that need to be addressed. Um, this is still in its early-ish days. There are lots of combi systems out there, have been for years. There's a question over here. This fellow's raising a hand. And we'll get you next. So the, the thing is that they've been out for a long time. They're not yet common. And what I'm trying to get at for this discussion is that the future is headed in the direction of this type of technology. All right. You and then you will make sure you get your time. Okay. Uh, Larry Lincoln's American Home Tech, but in a prior life, I was an HVAC installer. I've installed a lot of these types of systems. And there is a, one company that makes a lead-free coil for open systems, Unico systems, and I've used them. And it works fine, by the way. Thank you. Back here. I'm Martin Morehouse, Sunlane Power. Um, I um, have a number of questions, but I'll limit it to one. Um, the, uh, do you see, the, when is the uh, sort of Energy Star ratings going to sort of reflect some of your benefits and some of the drawbacks of an open draft system? It just, 62% it, is just not really enough, uh, <laughs> from my opinion. So is that, do you see change happening on the uh, Energy Star side? So the, the question you're asking has to do with the efficiency of a gas storage water heater? And you think that 62% is a high estimate or a low estimate? That's what the Energy Star rating is now. That, that's actually what the federal rating is for the water heater, and Energy Star says you have to be that or better in order to get credit. Right. Okay. So that seems pretty low for an energy efficient rating. Well, they started at 58. <laughs> So um, it, it seems low. The, by the way, the Energy Star rating goes up this year for atmospheric water heaters to 0.67. Um, and there is one water heater already on the market that qualifies under that set of rules. But in a sense, the bigger problem is, is the rating real? And, and the fact that ratings aren't, don't reflect the performance that equipment sees in the field is a huge issue because particularly as there's more and more money for efficiency, more and more incentives, more and more, you know, programs at the local level to try to get people to upgrade as they sell their house. I mean, programs galore basically use the ratings as the driver. And unless we've got ratings that drive people in the right direction and drive manufacturers to produce equipment that's going to perform and deliver and be accurate, we're basically being driven by false information. And boilers are a... Uh, you know, pretty big issue in terms of the ratings not reflecting actual performance because of the impact of uh, partial load. And Tom Butcher did an excellent, in fact, he presented at the Hot Water Forum last year, an excellent project looking at the seasonal performance of, of boilers, and actually there were combi systems in there too, um, but that Brookhaven National Lab ha would have that report, and it's excellent, but it shows that it, I think it was an 89% efficiency efficient system was seasonally a better performer than the 95, 96 combustion efficiency system. So we've got, we've got a real problem that we're not sending the signals that are going to get us the answers that we need, particularly as we move to higher performance housing. So it's a major, major issue. 